Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Daily Friend Show, the best source of news analysis about South Africa and the world at large. Uh, I am your host, Nicholas Farmer, and I'm, of course, joined today uh, by the tall man, the bearded man, um, Mr. Gabriel Krauser. Gabriel, how are you this week? Ah, very good. Very good start of week in the endless autumn of Johannesburg. Indeed, Enjoy. it is the best season in Johannesburg, um, in my humble opinion. Uh, and I am also joined, of course, by our uh, avatar of the East Rand, Mr. Marius Ruit. Marius, how are you? How's it, Nick? How's it, Gabriel? Let's hope my dog doesn't decide to start barking during this podcast, but we'll see. He's staring, he's sitting on the couch staring at me now, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we apologize in advance. <laughs> <on this laughs> if, if anything... Uh, so, guy, I, I saw that there's someone commenting that they got a bit of a, a scrook <laughs> last time. Um, anyway, let us go on with the big story of today. I, I think, you know, to be honest, there isn't that much news. There is currently some drama going on um, in Robbie Ridge, uh, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about tomorrow or on Wednesday. Um, but it's still kind of unfolding or will be close to unfolding by the time or will be will be probably finished by the time you actually hear this. Um, but the big news today is, of course, that Judge President uh, John Flope has been found guilty of gross misconduct by the Judicial Service Commission. Um, he, uh, they, they, they found that he breached provision of Section 165 of the Constitution and that he improperly attempted to influence um, justices of the Supreme Court, uh, Jafta and Nkabinde, uh, to violate their oaths of office. Both testified that Flope had sought to influence their ruling on Zuma's 2008 challenge to the legality of the search warrants used by the Scorpions, which of course no longer exist, um, to seize 93,000 documents now being used as evidence in a corruption case against him. Um, the, the tribunals also found that Flope's conduct seriously threatened and interfered with the independence, impartiality, dignity, effectiveness of the constitutional court, and his conduct threatened public confidence in the judicial system. Um, so this has now been sent to the head of the Judicial Service Commission, which is, of course, uh, uh, Justice Mokweng Mokweng. And now it, uh, we're going to see whether he gets impeached or not, which is on the table um, for him as a judge. Um, I saw there been several... Oh, there's the dog. <laughs> I saw there have been uh, several comments made on this. Most seem to think that this is probably the end of the line for uh, Judge Flope. He's had a very long and um, controversial career, to say the least. Uh, and I saw that Helen Zilla was saying that she doesn't think he's going to survive this. Gabriel, is Helen right? And do you think that this is the end of the line for Judge Flope? Also, what else should we take away from this case? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a balance of probabilities question. Uh, it does seem likely that Klope will be impeached. Let's remember that the complaint was brought forward by... Uh, it, the complaint was that he had approached two constitutional court justices uh, to encourage them to exonerate Jacob Zuma before he'd become president. The complaint was initially brought by... 11 constitutional court justices, the full bench, all in support of their colleagues saying, you know, we believe their version. They're saying that uh, Flopid tried to uh, influence them in improperly. That's a terrible thing. That's about 13 so, years ago. So it's taken so you, a wee while. You can't and, think of like basically a higher or more credible group of people to make an accusation than the full bench of the constitutional court. Why well, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. And it's absurd that it took so long. Um, I think it's worth noting the, the, the timing was, you know, there, there were delays as a result of uh, what one newspaper called a ping pong legal battle. Um, uh, it's also worth noting that uh, Zuma's, uh, some of his allies have not been enjoying great popularity just, just right now. Uh, I don't think that that's helpful, right? I don't think uh, it's particularly helpful for uh, different uh, Zoomerites to be sort of uh, robustly addressed all in the same window. That does create 
the the impression that there's a political motivation or coordination behind the scenes. Um, this is why swift justice is so important because then you say the reason the timing is now is because the thing happened, we've gathered the evidence, we've done the hearing. Okay, that's why the timing. When it's 13 years later, timing becomes a more interesting question. The other interesting thing about Klopp is that he's, look, he has been involved in various um, controversies, perhaps the most salient of which, uh, besides this particular case, is the allegation uh, of misconduct brought forward by the Deputy Chief Justice of the Western Cape, uh, Justice Gal Judge Goliath, who said that he verbally assaulted her, that he called her, quote, a piece of shit. Um, uh, she's got a recording of that, uh, that he tried to intimidate her. Uh, There's also then evidence of um, death threats or an attempt to assassinate her, actually, which is much more serious than death threats, coming from a, a sort of police cell where there was a guy who was charged with uh, assassinating an ANC Youth League figure and... Uh, it's all it's all very shady. One of the most concerning points there is the Daily Maverick reports, um, without source, but uh, maybe it's credible, that the police had instigated no investigation two months after uh, the JSCI had been made aware of these death threats or of this assassination plot. Uh, so it had been publicly exposed, but not then investigated. Uh, and as far as we can tell, there's been no resolution in that matter or the matter of uh, Judge Parker accusing Judge Schlope of physically assaulting him. So uh, we'll see if those things, um, th those allegations are further pursued. Maybe it's the case that once Schlope is found guilty of this, it'll be easier politically to find him guilty of the rest without him sort of pushing back with allegations of uh, you know, whatever card he wants to play. Um, but yeah, so, not, I mean, I think, not, it, I think it, it's all, the cards? <laughs> yeah, all of the cards. Uh, the point I'm trying to get at is that I think this is good news. Um, uh, it's, it's important. It's an important finding by the JSC. It'll be important, uh, to follow it up with real consequences, which I think shouldn't just end at impeachment. Uh, those other allegations in particular are, are criminal misconduct. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope that the process speeds up from here. I completely echo those sentiments. That's exactly right. Um, he is a man with an incredibly uh, bad track record. I think um, he was for a, a, a court found that he had um, unreasonably delayed his judgment on leave to appeal back in two thousand and four. He made allegations uh, against. Uh, accusing justices in the Western Cape of racism, but didn't seem to kind of really back them up. Um, he said awful things about attorneys in the past. He's He's got a terrible track record. And yet, only now, after 13 years, when his political faction in the ANC that he was allied to is on the downs, down, are we seeing uh, consequences brought against him, which is not great. But uh, that being said, like Gabriel just said, it uh, is good that something is actually is happening. Um, Marius, do you think this is going to strengthen people's faith in the, ju in the judiciary, or what? What do you think will be the general outcome of this uh, case? Well, it does look like um, Judge Lopez is in a bit of trouble here, and uh, as you say, it's probably uh, uh, just a sort of a proxy battle for what's happening inside the ANC at the moment. Because uh, what will happen now is the JSC will decide whether this goes to Parliament and. And Parliament, uh, if if uh, if they decide he, John Chalope was guilty of gross mis misconduct, then this will go to the National Assembly, and the National Assembly will then vote on John Chalope's fate. And I believe a two-thirds majority is necessary for him to be impeached. So that's pretty big. But I mean, uh, if uh, Cyril Ramaphosa can, uh, as what he did with the public protector, get most of the NC caucus on his side, along with the DA, and I assume a couple of other parties will probably. I mean, I. The EFF will probably, I mean, without even having any idea what the EFF thinks about John Chlope, I'm pretty sure they'll oppose any uh, movement to, uh, you know, to get rid of John Chlope. So, uh, they, I mean, we're pretty sure there's going to be at least 10% of Parliament that will vote against impeaching John Chlope. So, but, uh, you know, maybe uh, the, this is maybe a bit of a clutching of straws, but maybe it does show that Sora Ramaphosa is finally moving against, you know, elements of... Uh, the Zuma faction, or the you know the people who've been really guilty of really, uh, you know, the really gross misconduct, like like John Chlope and so on, 
And then we would see this big uh, battle going on in the ANC between, uh, you know, the Magashule faction on one side and then the Ramposa faction on, what, uh, on the other. But I mean, uh, as our senior colleague Franz Cornier has pointed out, uh, the Ramposa faction is not exactly a bunch of reformists. They are just not as corrupt as the RET slash Zuma slash Magashule faction. So even if this does show that Ramaposa is coming out on top, we must expect that this means now suddenly we're going to have all kinds of economic reforms and we're going to put EWC on the back burner and we're going to, you know, reform the labor market or anything like that. Just means, yeah, maybe the, the slide into anarchy might take 10 years instead of nine years, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Gabriel, do you, uh, do you have any final thoughts on this topic and, and particularly on that final comment of Morris's? Yeah, nine years or ten years. It's a, <laughs> a, a year makes a difference uh, looking forward. And a year yeah. also makes a, a difference looking backwards. Um, I think that it's just it's it's just really important. I, I, I respect uh, procedural justice. I think that this is a a very important concept that doesn't get enough airtime in South Africa. Um, a just, you know, you might think that a fair consequence if we're sitting around the table is I get half the pie and you get half the pie and it doesn't matter who cuts it. Uh, but proper justice requires that the, pr not only that the outcome is what you would like, but that the process is what you would like it to be too. And I just don't see, I have followed this case through the newspapers and through a couple of books through the years. And I can't see a procedural justification for this um, delay. Flaupe acted as a nuisance. Some of the, the it, it, procedurally, this this hasn't been ideal. It's been far from ideal, and that does taint uh, the outcome so far. And yeah, yeah, and and will will make the battle just more political than it needs to be going forward. Indeed. So and as Gabriel and I had said on our podcast uh, that came out over the weekend to Crickets and a Thorn Tree, um, procedure is a very precious thing. And when you mess with it, you mess with um, a lot of things and you can cause you can cause a lot of damage uh, beyond what the immediate circumstances might might seem to suggest. So I agree completely with you there, that Gabriel, that uh, the fact that the procedure doesn't seem to have been good here is, isn't a good sign, but still better late than never, I suppose. Um, and hopefully he's removed from the bench because... I just encourage our listeners to go and look at his Wikipedia page. Um, it's a bit out of date, but man, there are so many controversies attached to John Lope. He should have been gone a very long time ago from the bench, I think. Um, and let's hope that he is. Anyway, let us move on overseas um, to something that I didn't expect to be talking about again so soon, which is the British royal family. Um, we, of course, talked a little bit about uh, the, the controversy around Meghan Markle and uh, Prince Harry. But now the royal family has lost uh, one of its senior members, that being uh, Prince Consort Philip, who is the husband of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, he was 99 years old. He had been ill recently and been in and out of hospital a bit. And he passed away uh, last week. A colorful character he was. He is, uh, and I, I also, there's another thing I recommend our listeners and, and watchers do is they go and look up quotes from him over the years because there are some, <laughs> he had some turns of phrase that got him into trouble, um, including when he said to a group of uh, British students visiting China during a state visit, he said, I believe um, if you stay here much lo longer, you'll all end up slitty eyed, which is, yeah one view um <laughs> anyway he so he was he was certainly a controversial figure in some uh things and and some people accused him of being a racist but he was also famous for being a very strong supporter of his wife um he, he was famous for kind of keeping her up through the years through the very difficult years the monarchy went through when uh, princess diana died and there was even some threats to abolish it um he also had a strange relationship with a group of people living on a remote island in Vanuatu uh, who believed that he was a reincarnation of an ancient warrior and so believed that he was some sort of demigod who could bless their crops. Um, and so <laughs> a curious character, uh, Marius, uh, any thoughts on his life and, and, and anything beyond what I've, what I've said here? I know, as you say, I mean, he was uh, stood by the queen. I think he's the 
longest serving uh, con consort in British history, which makes sense because I'm open to correction, but I think uh, Queen Elizabeth is the longest serving monarch in British history. And I think she's the right. third longest serving monarch in the, the world's think, history. I think they were married for 70 years. Uh, yeah, they were married in, or even longer than that. I think they were married in 1947, I think. So, and uh, yeah, so they were actually related. They were second cousins once removed, but that is quite a common thing amongst the royal family. At least it's a bit further. I mean, uh, we will know what happened. I think it was uh, also Prince Philip, I think, in uh, Spain, who was severely handicapped because his parents or his uh, parents were basically cousins in a certain bit. But yeah, uh, that's going off a bit of a tangent there. Yeah, but I think Prince Philip, uh, he was criticized. As you said, he was, um, he made some gaffes. Uh, I believe he said to a man who'd, uh, lost his sight in a, he was a, a member of the British Army and they've been presented to uh, Prince Philip and the Queen. The man had lost his sight in, uh, in, in an explosion and he said to <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, uh, I can see the man has lost his sight, look at the tie he chose for today. You know, <laughs> but apparently afterwards the guy said, uh, you know, he, he wasn't offended by it and that was, Prince Philip was this type of guy who tried to use humour to defuse, you know, I, make people feel at ease. There was another one um, that I thought was worth mentioning, which is, do you remember the Pakistani girl? I can't remember her name. I think it's Ma'ala or something. Oh, they're shot they're shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. She got shot in the face by the Taliban because they didn't want girls to go to school. She survived and she became this activist for, for women's education. Mm. Um, when he met her, he said to her, the only reason parents want their children at school is so they can get them out of the house, to which apparently <laughs> she thought was very funny. <laughs> so he certainly had a particular sense of humor. <laughs> Uh, but it was also he was apparently quite a modernist. There was actually his suggestion that the coronation was broadcast live on national on British national TV, and he also brought uh, you know some innovations into um, uh, Buckingham Palace and the various castles and palaces. You know he kind of went and decided to try and make the place more efficient, and you know apparently rationalised a lot of the British uh, royal family staff and so on, and make it a bit more efficient, modernise it to a large degree. And uh, as I say, he's, he's, he said some. Uh, uh, silly things in the past, but I think uh, most men of his age probably say some embarrassed things uh, from time to time. And overall, he hasn't really embarrassed the royal family. I mean, much less of an embarrassment than his son, Prince Andrew, for example. And I mean, there's been no real, Prince Philip, there's no real controversies about him apart from saying some silly things occasionally. And I mean, you know, like uh, he, I mean, he joined the Royal Navy at the age of 18 in 1939. He fought bravely in World War II. He was mentioned in dispatches. So it's a man who's done a lot and he gave his life up for public service. You know, apparently he had his own ambitions of uh, going far in the Royal Navy, but obviously when uh, Queen Elizabeth became queen much earlier than she expected to, her father, uh, I think it was George VI, died quite young. And yeah, so she became queen far, uh, far earlier than she thought she was going to. So Prince Philip had to put a lot of his own ambitions aside. And overall, I think he's, uh, you know, he was a, a, a fellow who kind of kept to the, yeah, you know, he was a, he was a good support for the queen, I think. You know, he, he supported her, but he also didn't uh, try to overshadow her in any way. And as I say, he managed to keep out of controversy, uh, you know, speaking uh, broadly. Yeah, so I think uh, the Queen's obviously, I mean, they were married for over 70 years. So I think this is a blow, obviously, to the Queen and to uh, the UK. And yeah, we'll have to see. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the Queen passes away. Then we'll have Charles. So there's been some rumors that the, they might skip Charles and go straight to William, but I don't think that's uh, likely. So Wish we'll see how many. Yeah, yeah. We will. We'll see uh, how, um, uh, and but the queen still seems quite sprightly, so I'm sure she'll still be with us for a good couple of years. Right, I mean, yeah, I hope so. I mean, she's 96, though. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, she, she's she's playing a very long innings, and I think suffering the loss of a husband yeah. is often associated with a, a, a kind of lethal depression uh, for older people, so it is worth keeping that in mind. My, my own tenuous sort of... Uh, I don't know, point of interest here is that as a high school student, I went to a leadership conference at Gordonston High School, which is the high school that uh, Prince Philip went to. And uh, he was one of the sort of first students that was fairly recently mm -hmm. established at the time in Scotland. And uh, yeah, the stories were very much still alive of, of him getting sort of the lash, just like any old other boy. Previously, there'd been a sort of tradition of the whipping boy where, where royalty would have a friend who got whipped on their behalf. Uh, but I think it, it, was, very, it was very egalitarian, mm. the, 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 the kinds of rituals that they went through, which were quite tough um, mm. in cold Scotland by the lochs. Uh, it was interesting. And we met uh, Princess Anne there, who spoke very eloquently about the, 
the usefulness of an aristocracy being somewhat cosmopolitan. It's an interesting feature of the British royal family that it is by bloodline and by a sort of mode of connection quite international. Uh, mm -hmm. That, yeah, Philip spent a lot of his time uh, in the Commonwealth going around trying to spread the good word. They had good relations with you know, former royalty in Greece, but also in the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands and so on that they try to make this argument for the common interest. And I think in Philip's case, it is particularly acute because of what one might call the lived experience of growing up a little bit German and uh, seeing the collapse of Anglo-German relations in the build-up into World War II. Well, I think he considered um, himself Danish um, by, by birth, actually, because yeah. he, was, he was a prince of Denmark and Greece. Um, but and he was born in Greece. Greece. Right, yes. but he had to be Greece at so, a very young age but had family in germany and and yes so that was actually quite interesting so gordonston that school just mentioned it was actually established by a german jew who fled the nazis and the plan was for philip to go to school in germany but obviously when the with the nazi takeover they decided no, it's not really a great place for a young boy so they sent him to that school and that's where he was uh, educated and so on and he sent uh, charles there and even though it was a bit of a rough place, he sent Charles there on purpose, even though he knew Charles was going to get bullied and not have a great time. Because yes. he thought, you know, the guy needs to uh, get, get some character. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so but then right. also, and there's, I'm just, Philip's, there's uh, this strange yeah. egalitarianism, you know, it's like, it seems all fancy and uh, mm. sort of behind the, behind the palace walls of Buckingham. Uh, it, it might be hard to look through the window, but I think if one does, you see, you see people like you and I, who try to find spaces in which they can engage on a sort of face-to-face -face moral basis as equals mm -hmm. on the sports field in the classroom yeah. and so on and that and that's a, a serious project to uh to look up to i think i think we all um are somewhere on some kind of power and property hierarchy mm -hmm. Uh, we're all luckier than some and less lucky than others. But it's very important to try and find those ways of engaging as peers. And I think that's part of what Philip did with his humor. I think it's part of what came from that sort of high school experience. Mm, um, right, right. Finding common humanity amongst people. Right. I think he's definitely one of the reasons why the British monarchy has continued to be a fairly popular and modern institution, despite the fact that it's a thousand year old theocracy, <laughs> not really <laughs> rooted in the country anymore. Um, it's managed to kind of keep up a pace in the modern age, uh, despite quite a lot of challenge. And yeah, we'll see where it goes to. Um, yeah, there was a I little bit see. of speculation. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, uh, there were all these memes obviously came out as soon as Philip passed away. And the one that made me laugh quite a lot was a picture of Philip saying, a Greek immigrant who's been living on benefits for nearly a century passes away. <laughs> yeah, I think he would have liked that. I think he would have laughed at that. Yeah, it does seem like the kind of joke he would tell about himself. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and there was, I think, some speculation that um, what often happens in these cases when in the modern age, when a monarch gets kind of a bit old or past it, that they might abdicate um but everyone involved in the palace or anyone with any knowledge of this seems to say that uh, there's no chance that queen elizabeth is going to do that because she believes that her uh, oath that she took to serve until her death mm. uh it's a very binding one so she and, and also because of her uncle there's quite a lot of uh, stigma around abdication i mean obviously yeah. if uh, right. most of our listeners will know edward uh, oh, i don't edward the sixth was it anyway he had to abdicate because he was married wanted to marry an american divorcee and then his brother, Queen Elizabeth's father, became the king. Yes, and also because he was a bit of a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, that also wasn't great, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it was at Goebbels or Goering's wedding or one of the... It was at some big Nazi's wedding. I can't remember who, though. Uh, although or him, though, one of his guys. A lot of people in Europe weren't afraid to be seen with the Nazis until a little bit later. Mm. Yeah, yeah, including Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's um, that's definitely a topic for another day. <laughs> but he um, wasn't going. At least he was wasn't nice going to headline. Nazi parties there. He I was, was trying to get nice PCL. headline uh, 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 from I think it was the Sowetan, uh, which said Queen's Corsi returns, and I thought this was a nice, delicate way of dealing with the fact that you've got a queen and a prince consult, and mm. Corsi means something like king. So the Queen's king returns mm. as a as a euphemism use for, use for passing on or dying. Um, mm. Then I went and bought the newspaper, and the article is actually about. A uh, TV show called The Queen, uh, and a guy <laughs> called Horsey. <laughs> like but I've got a feeling that the, editors, the, the, the editors knew that they'd be getting the double sense of meaning, and I and I I think that's also just a nice way of thinking about it. The Queen's Horsey, 
uh, yeah. has returned home. This the spirit has indeed. Um, and I believe that was also, roughly speaking, the view of that Vanuatu group who, who thought he was a demigod, is that uh, his spirit would now inhabit another body and uh, it would live on. So they sent, they apparently sent some correspondence to that effect to the queen um, yeah. uh, as, as, as consolation for her loss. Anyway, uh, let us move on from that. Uh, very briefly, we're going to talk in the last couple of minutes here about France, which is a country that none of us are an expert in, but we have a little bit of uh, insight here and there, I think. And the key news there is that the uh, French leader, or the French leader of the main, the largest, I guess, opposition group, uh, the National Rally, previously known as the National Front, Marie Le Pen, has announced her intention to run for president of France in 2022. Now, she ran against uh, Emmanuel Macron um, last time, um, the, the French have two rounds of voting for president. She came second in the first round, very close to Macron, but then got creamed by him in the third round when she only got a third of the vote rather than Macron's two thirds. Um, however, there was a poll recently that said that she was only very slightly behind Macron at around 48% to Macron's 52%. This is probably the reason for her running. Uh, she's also famous for having taken the, the, the National Front Party um, from her father, who was the previous leader, and completely reforming it to try and make it less. It was associated very much with uh, monarchism, reactionary groups, neo-fascism, things like that. And she reformed it a lot to be make it become a much more mainstream party in France, which is perhaps one of the reasons why its name is now the National Rally. Morris, uh, in 30 seconds or so, your thoughts on this? Yeah, it'll be quite interesting. I think it's uh, one thing the last couple of years has made us, uh, uh, we have to take into account is that you can't really rely on the old certainties. And I think um, uh, Le Pen victory is definitely not out of the question, just as uh, we've shown that with Donald Trump winning in 2016 in the US and the Brexit referendum result in uh, 2016, I think it was as well. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it shows you that uh, uh, Nothing, you yeah, expect the unexpected sort of, and I think, uh, yeah, Marine Le Pen's probably going to push uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, pretty hard. Uh, I think, I mean, if I put money on it, I'd still say Macron's going to win, but obviously wouldn't, uh, you know, bet my house on it. But just a very interesting thing about French uh, elections is uh, Le Pen won whatever it was, 30% of the votes, more than that, and her political party, uh, uh, it's only got 1% uh, of the seats in the French parliament. So it shows there's quite a big... Uh, the big split in France between, uh, you know, they can put the person, they can separate the personality from the parties off in the team. So it'll be interesting if she does win, it'll probably be quite likely that she won't have anything close to a, a parliamentary majority where Macron had much more support in parliament than Le Pen did. So if she does become president, she'll probably have quite a hard time of, uh, getting anything done though. So, but yeah, but I think it shows that if Le Pen, uh, even the fact that she's doing well shows, I think there's also quite a lot of skepticism about the EU in France, which along with Germany is basically it's, uh, two of its core states. So it's something to watch out for the, in the future, I think. Indeed. Um, and of course, France has been going through a lot of political turmoil recently because mm -hmm. the Socialist Party, which was, of course, very strong for a long time, seems to have mostly collapsed. Um, and Macron's new party uh, made big waves. And now the Front National uh, or the, the National Rally is, is also making big showings. Um, although not necessarily in Parliament, as you point out. Uh, Mar uh, Gabriel, any any thoughts in sort of 30 seconds or so? Yeah, I think that uh, one pattern that people are going to be looking at uh, for years to come, for the, for the rest of this decade, is the connection between the timing of COVID and lockdown and the elections and what kind of dividend or punishment you get. Um, mm -hmm. So I think American politics, it's hard to imagine the same outcome uh, being as certain uh, if the coronavirus hadn't hit in 2020. Um, right. While you're in the plague, while you're in the economic downturn, I think there can be huge incumbent punishment. Uh, so, you know, immediately announce the lockdown. It's like, okay, let's rally together. A few months later, it's sort of, oh, people are dying. This is terrible. Um, but a few years later, uh, something to look out for is the rebound effect. What happens when you uh, face an election a couple of years after the virus, which means that economic growth will have been unusually high or for low base, uh, where people get to look in the rearview mirror and uh, maybe relax a little bit of the, the panic that once was had. 
uh, look with uh, greater sympathy upon those in, in power who made decisions that do stand up to retrospective scrutiny. And I think a lot of Macron's decisions do do that. So I, I wouldn't uh, discount the possibility of a serious surge uh, for Macron's popularity, as well as for governments who had a tough time pushing through this, but face an election in, in some years to come after a recovery. Right. Now, that's a very interesting take. Um, and of course, we shall see because we will be watching it closely. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, share this video, all of that good stuff. And we'll see you tomorrow for the next episode of The Daily Friend Show. Cheers, everyone.